Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. We continue our focus on biodiversity by looking at the critical role of pollinators in our ecosystems. And today I'm delighted to be joined by our very special guest speaker, Lorna Cole, who is an agricultural ecologist with Scotland's Rural College, also known as SRUC. Lorna, good morning. Good morning. And uh, Lorna, you're a lecturer in uh, conservation and wildlife management, is that right? Yes, that's right. So I teach the ecology subjects and surveying, so and a little bit of data handling, which the students aren't so keen on. <laughs> Very good. Well, um, before we uh, uh, go to your presentation, just want to introduce everyone to Pat Murphy, who is the head of our Chagas Knowledge Transfer Program on Environment. Good morning to you, Pat. Good morning. Very good. Well, look, uh, Lorna, we will hand over to you. So for your presentation, and we'll take some questions then afterwards. So today I'm going to discuss some of the research we've been conducting, looking at how pollinators utilize different habitats and agricultural landscapes and how this has implications for agri-environmental policy. I'm wondering why should we bother about pollinators? Well, I'm sure everyone will have seen something in the media lately about pollinators declining and the potential threats that has to food security. But is this simply media hype? The recently published GNCC figures do indicate that pollinators are declining. And these figures are based on 365 species. So quite a robust data set of both bees and hoverflies. So it doesn't appear to be media hype. It appears that pollinators are in decline. So do we need them at all? Well, for me, I just love these little guys. Um, they're so interesting. So the little lady in the top left, she's a gypsy cuckoo bee. She sneaks into the nest of other bees lays her eggs and leaves the colony to bring up her young, much like her namesake, the cuckoo bird. The bottom we have a hoverfly called Ringia campestris, and this wee guy is commonly called the Heineken hoverfly because he's got huge mouse parts and he can reach the parts of plants other hoverflies can't. But of course, it's not just that these guys are fascinating. They're fundamentally important to food security. So it's been estimated that pollinators increase the fruit set. That's the number of fruits, the number of flowers that become fruits, the quality and yield in 75% of crops worldwide. And these aren't non-significant crops. These crops account for about 30% of global food production. Because of this, they've been estimated to be worth in excess of 600 million per annum to the UK economy. Pollinators aren't just important for pollinating our crops. A lot of our wildflowers also rely on them. So 85% of the world's flowering plants rely on some sort of animal pollination. So we can see how pollination creates the habitats within our countryside, our heather moorlands, our woodlands, our hedgerows. So given pollinators are important, do we actually need a diversity? Could we just send in hives of honeybees? Well, flowers and pollinators have co-evolved and because of this, different flowers have, are adapted to be pollinated by different pollinators. The oilseed rape pits a relatively open flower. It's visited by a wide variety of insects, but overwhelmingly it's mainly flies, hoverflies and honeybees. If you look at the little pie chart, if we compare that to field beans, it's quite startling that field beans are predominantly pollinated by 
bumblebees. And the reason for this is that field beans have very complex flower structures and they can really only be accessed legitimately by long-tongued bumblebees such as the garden bumblebee. I say legitimately because pollinators can be sneaky. We get species such as the buff-tailed bumblebee. It cuts a little hole in the bottom of the flower and it steals the nectar. So here the buff-tailed bumblebee is getting fed, whereas the plant is not getting pollinated. So obviously a diversity of pollinators help provide pollination services for a variety of crops. But in addition to this, pollinators, a uh, diversity of pollinators can also stabilize pollination services. So as an example, the honeybee, it's a little bit woozy and it doesn't like to get out its hive unless it's nice and warm above 13 degrees. Whereas the bumblebee, it's much more robust and species such as the buff-tailed bumblebee will be foraging as low as 10 degrees. So we can see in situations, especially in southwest Scotland, where we could have a very cool spring and all the honeybees are tucked in their hive providing no pollination services. And in these instances, these services are picked up by species such as the buff-tailed bumblebee. So having a diversity of pollinators can stabilize pollination services in different weather conditions. So given we need um, pollinators, given we need a diversity of pollinators, the next question is, are the declines actually adversely impacting food production? And to answer this question, I'm going to draw on a study by Tom Breeze from the University of Reading. Now, Tom, he set out questionnaire studies across 10 European countries to both farmers and beekeepers. I'm going to focus on the results for farmers. The first thing that we found in this study was 49% of farmers perceived they were losing yield, either yield or quality in their crops as a result of insufficient pollination services. So that's what we'd call a pollination deficit. What I found even more interesting is of those 49% who perceived they were losing either yield or quality, 44% of farmers actually didn't take any sort of action. And to me, this really hit home. Um, it kind of indicated that almost half of farmers that we surveyed that were experiencing a deficit didn't, cons didn't actually do anything to try and rectify that. So they weren't considering pollination as an agricultural input they could manage, for example, by introducing honeybees or um, improving habitat for wild bees. And I just can't see a situation where a farmer knew he was losing yield due to, an, due to lack of fertilizer, for example, without taking any action against it. So I think that's a message we need to get home to farmers that they can manage pollination services. So, Intensive agriculture has been identified as a major driver of pollinator declines. We've got the loss of semi-natural habitats, such as hedgerow and farm woodlands. We've got the loss of traditional farming practices. So we have hay meadows disappearing for silage production. We've also got an increased use of agrochemicals, and that's not just insecticides and herbicides, but also in organic fertilizers. Agricultural systems have become more specialized in what they produce, so they tend to be either dairy system or arable systems. And because of this, we've lost diversity at the farm level. And there's also the introduction of managed pollinators. We often 
forget about the positive ways agriculture can influence pollinators. We've got voluntary initiatives such as the Pastor, Pastures for Life accreditation. We've got more farmers adopting integrated pest management. And then we've got agri-environment policy, so regulatory compliance. In the current round of the CAP, we've got diversification. We've got agri-environment and climate schemes, ecological focus areas. In the CAP post 2020, we are looking at new eco schemes to supplement these. And I guess what's important that these agricultural drivers sit amidst a whole cocktail of other drivers, such as climate change and invasive species. And we don't know what this cocktail is actually doing as well. We don't know how these different drivers are interacting. So given agriculture or intensive agriculture is resulting in pollinator declines, should we actually go back to traditional farming practices? Well, the world's population is currently sitting at 7.6 billion people. And by 2050, it's expected to rise to 9.6 billion. Not only is our world population increasing, developing countries are becoming more affluent and quite rightly, they're expecting to eat like we do. So because of this, the world's expecting a 70% increase in food demand. And while some of this increase will be met by a decrease in wastage, it's still estimated we'll need 50% more food production to feed our growing and more affluent population. So in the past, as we've intensified agricultural production, environmental quality across a range of things, soil quality, water quality, biodiversity has tended to decline. So we really do need to find innovative ways that we can maximise food production whilst minimising the environmental impacts. We need to get that balance absolutely right. To try and answer some of these questions, we undertook a study on pollinators and this study took a landscape scale approach we wanted to know what habitats pollinators were using in an intensive grassland landscape. And we wanted to know the potential for these habitats to complement each other. For example, did they support different species? Or perhaps they provided different resources? Or perhaps they provided resources at different points in the season? Our first step was to actually see what habitats we had in our catchment. So we started by mapping out all the habitats using spatial data sets. We were then able to identify 12 habitats that broadly covered the entire catchment. And these habitats were either the dominant or we felt were important for biodiversity. So this is our catchment. It's typical of grassland catchments in the southwest of Scotland. It's based in the seismic catchment, which is just south of Glasgow. And we've got very lush green fields because we do get a lot of rain. So even in this catchment, we can see we've got nice pockets of semi-natural habitat. So this is a road verge near Craig Head Farm. And this road verge had a diversity of plants, including butterfly orchids, it had the small heath butterfly, and it was really quite a nice habitat. Here we've got a water margin, a riparian buffer strip at Killoch Farm. And this buffer strip, when we visited in June, it was really quite unremarkable. But when we went back in July, it was absolutely teeming with ringlet butterflies. And these butterflies were very constrained in this one water margin. We didn't get them 
in the surrounding grassland fields at all. Here we've got an area of scrub at Dolph Sagan Farm and this area of scrub was full of devil's bit scabious late on in the season and it provided a very important late season forage resource for a wide range of pollinators. And finally, we've got an area of rough grassland and this area of grassland supported some grassland specialist bust butterflies such as the meadow brown and the small heath. So we wanted to quantify the pollinators that were in these habitats and we did this using standardised transit walks. What I love about sampling in grassland fields is the enthusiastic cows we get. The cows just love an ecologist in their field. I think we're like cow TV. So we amused the cows from June to September and we surveyed bumblebees and hoverflies that were foraging and we surveyed butterflies which could easily be identified on the wings so we surveyed them whether they were foraging or not. And these are our key results. We can see that road verges and riparian buffer strips were the top habitats and that was both for hoverflies shown in the top graph and bumblebees shown in the bottom graph. Unsurprisingly, we found intensive grassland and arable land supported very few pollinators. I found it quite surprising that the deciduous and the coniferous woodland supported few pollinators as well, particularly the deciduous woodland. However, in our study area, deciduous woodland was unmanaged and it was very, very dense and there was little floral resources at ground level. Finally, we have our results for butterflies. There's quite a lot of similarity here. Again, we find road verges, riparian buffer strips to be good habitats. We find woodland and intensive grassland and arable habitats to be poor for butterflies. However, here we found the open scrub and intact hedgerows were also good for butterflies. So we heard yesterday, Catherine spoke a lot about um, how we can manage hedgerows for biodiversity and here we can see they provide shelter and food plants for butterfly larvae. So both open scrub and hedgerows were important as well. I have to put a cautionary statement in this. Um, when we were surveying, we were surveying at ground level, which meant we were totally oblivious to what pollinators may have been foraging in the tree canopy and trees and woodland are very important at providing early season resources. So resources in spring, so again, our survey timing might have undervalued woodland. An interesting thing from the research is we were able to monitor these habitats through time and we found that what habitats pollinators used varied depending on the flowers that were in bloom in that habitat. So for example, we found buffer strips were good for bumblebees early in the season, whereas later on in the season, road verges became more important. And this was even more the case for hoverflies. What was particularly interesting about this is it shows late in the season, these road verges are crucially important. And late in the season was exactly when the council were cutting these verges. So we were literally trying to survey before the council cut the verges. We had the guy diverting him to a different road verge while we surveyed our verge. So it showed that throughout that catchment at the most important time of year, these resources were totally vanishing overnight. 
But what these results do say is that different habitats can complement each other at the landscape scale. And overwhelmingly, these trends were driven by floral resources. So the abundance, the richness of pollinators was strongly driven by the number of plant species. The next study I will focus on looks at compulsory greening measures and in particular ecological focus areas. You'll know that these were introduced as part of the CAP 2014 reform. Now 19 EFAs were introduced throughout Europe and member states could decide which of these EFAs they wanted to implement. Our study aimed to use expert evaluation to first determine what resources different EFAs offered and then to try and work out how well EFAs as a whole were performing for pollinators. So the first step was a really nice step. It was a workshop in Cluj, Romania. I was lucky enough to team up with Lynn Dix and Jane Stout and we co-hosted this workshop. At the workshop, we determined what resources we should focus on and we decided to focus on nesting sites for both bumblebees and solitary bees. We decided to focus on hoverfly larvae resources for both insectivorous hoverflies and saprophytic, so the hoverflies that feed on decaying organic matter. We decided to look at floral resources, so both when different habitats flowered and also the types of flowers they supported. So did they support open flowers or tubular flowers? Also at this workshop, we determined what standard and pollinator friendly management looked like in these different habitats. Our next step was our expert evaluation. And here we were lucky enough to use the Super Bee Network and we engaged a total of 22 experts from 18 different countries. And we had eight experts from Northern Europe, five from Southern and five from Eastern Europe. We started by asking the experts to score EFAs under standard and pollinator friendly management. And we use this to calculate an average score for each of our geographical regions. We then fed these scores back to our experts and we asked them if they wanted to change their score based on the group response, maybe they had been unsure and the group response made them think a little differently and also to justify the scores they were given. And this was an iterative process. We repeated it a couple of times before we found our final scores. And these are the results for our EFAs for floral resources in Southern Europe. And the key things I want you to take from this graph is firstly, that by increasing, by making more, by adopting more pollinator friendly habitat, we can increase the floral resources. And that happened irrespective of what habitat we were looking at. The other thing to know is that different habitats provided different floral resources. So for example, Rotational coppice was found to provide little in the way of floral resources, whereas field margins provided relatively high resources. And these graphs, I know it's horrible, but really I just want you to see the general trends. So again, across all our resource categories and geographical locations, making a habitat or managing it in a more pollinator friendly way increases the resource value. But also we can see that different habitats provide different resources, whether it's floral nesting or larvae resources, and there's no consistent 
pattern of these across the three geographical locations. I'm now going to focus in in Northern Europe results. And these are the results for pollinator friendly management. And if we look across the line and we take a value of over two to indicate that good resources are provided, we can see that no single habitat provides all the resources that pollinating species require. And I think that's a very important message. Aside from this is how farmers uh, have uptaken the different EFAs. And throughout Europe, only 7% of EFAs were not fallow nitrogen fixing or catch crop. And because of that uptake value, it means predominantly uptake bias. It means that predominantly in Europe, these were the three main habitats that EFAs created. Again, when we look across jointly, these habitats aren't providing all the resources at good quantities. And in particular, what we found was lacking in Northern Europe was hoverfly larvae resources. So the fact that no single habitat provides all the resources pollinating species require indicates what we need to do is create habitat bundles or a pollinator package where we put together habitats that are complementary in the resources they offer. So for bumblebees, this might look like, we know bumblebees, they like to nest in areas of rough tussocky vegetation. And then in April, we know hedgerows and trees such as bird cherry trees and willow trees can provide important early season resources. I think it's also important to acknowledge that the agricultural matrix, agricultural cropland also provides resources. For example, we have oilseed rape in May. And then finally, later on in, in summer, they all move to the flower rich field margins. In Scotland, at least, these field margins don't typically flower till quite late on in the season. So our overall implications for the CAP post-2020, firstly, it's vitally important that we improve habitat quality. We want to get the most out of any land we do take out of production. To do this, we need to have clear guidelines, and these guidelines should be habitat specific, so farmers know how to, measure, how to manage that habitat in a more pollinator friendly management. Then I think we need to incentivize positive management and this could be achieved through result based payments. I think fundamental to result based payments is to ensure we have a robust monitoring framework. And for me, I think it's essential that any indicator we have should be farmer friendly. So farmers should be able to monitor themselves. They should be able to benchmark their farm's performance. And that would enable them to adapt their management to increase the quality of the habitat. And finally, we need to enhance landscape diversity because no single habitat provided all the resources pollinators require, we need to support landscape scale initiatives. So we need to facilitate collaboration between farmers because this is a landscape scale approach. And we need to look at habitat bundles. So what habitats can we package together to ensure all the resources are provided? And finally, I think when it comes to these packages, we need to look at integrating the different green architecture delivery vehicles. So that would, in the CAP post 2020, we could integrate 
agri-environment climate schemes, eco-schemes and enhanced conditionality. So if we find, for example, in a landscape that a, a certain resort isn't being provided, we could introduce eco-schemes to provide that resource. And I think this is the most important part of my talk. We are all used to seeing slides that show the impact of farming on pollinators. I think it's important to acknowledge that farmers are also under a lot of pressure. And I would even go as far as to say there's no as a small business that has to contend with so many different pressures. Farmers must protect their natural assets to ensure long-term economic sustainability. They're faced with pest weeds and diseases. They're faced with climate change. This year alone, we've seen extremes of drought and we've seen flooding. On top of that, they're faced with Brexit in the UK and in Southern Ireland. And they're faced with this constant change in EU policy, global policy and legislation, such as changes in agri-environment screens, changes in subsidies, changes in the chemicals they can use. And finally, they're faced with fluctuating local EU and global food markets. So I think if agri-environment policy is to work, it must work for the people on the ground. There's no point in creating a policy if it doesn't work for the farmer because farmers simply won't adopt it and will be no further forward. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention and I'd also like to thank the many wonderful people that have allowed me to undertake these research topics. Thank you very much, Lorna. Excellent presentation and uh, really useful to, to see the, the results of those various studies. Um, you, you talked a lot about uh, at the end of your talk there about the, the policy implications of all of these studies. And uh, it's, it, I remember speaking to a farmer at one stage and he, he was describing him, himself as the endangered species at one stage. Um, and, and you make that point very well. Uh, in terms of, of policies and programmes uh, that to support pollinators in Scotland, uh, what have you have you noted any novel uh, approaches there in Scotland, and, and have you adopted that results based uh, approach? Um, I think we've got some proposals that are currently um, underway for this type of approach. I know this. A few people looking into it. I think really that you guys are leading the way with the lights of the Burren project. I think it's fantastic work you're doing. I think that Scotland will catch up very soon. Mm -hmm. well, we're very proud of the, the Burren project, particularly the, the engagement at all levels, at a local level, uh, and the farmers are very much part of the conversation there in the Burren. In terms of actual um, uh, land use management policy, is there such a thing in, in Scotland? I know you, you, you have spoken about your, your interest in integrated land management or land use management. So we've got a lot of um, policies based on sustainable land use. Um, obviously, we've got your agri-environment climate schemes. We have our rural development policies. We've got, you know, the European policies, cap greening. Um, in Scotland, we are quite unsure of what's happening next, whether we are going to adopt um, or follow suit with Europe or whether we are going to adopt what England's going to adopt. So it's a bit uncertain. Okay. Like, like many other countries, I imagine we're still in that hiatus uh, between uh, different caps. Pat, uh, some interesting questions coming through there on, on the uh, Q&A tab. Um, yep. And please do, uh, if you have questions, 
uh, that you'd like us to uh, put to, to Lorna, do put them through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Okay, uh, uh, one from Dara Hulagan. Uh, uh, great talk, Lorna. In relation to road verges, is there a danger that pollinators are attracted to road verges because of the absence of other habitats that road verges end up uh, and, uh, and in a ally as ecological uh, traps? In other words, I suppose that they they get destructed and maybe there's uh, it's a dangerous place to be operating. I think we are currently doing a research project looking at road verge management and what hits me is these verges need to be in the right place. So what I would suggest is that there's obviously risks for pollinators being next to roads and in occasions you see the central reservation of motorways being managed for pollinators, which I would say is a very bad idea, um, but it's targeting where you put these. So we are serving in a lot of rural road verges where traffic volumes are low. And I mean, we have seen the odd pollinator getting killed by traffic. We've seen them lying in the road dead. But on the whole, I think the benefits outweigh the costs. And what I what I kind of think is where we need to ensure food security. On one side of the hedge, we're taking land out of production and we're decreasing food production. And the other side of the hedge, there's a road verge. So to me, it makes more sense to optimise the use of the road verge rather than take land out of production. Okay, uh, just a, a, a fairly specific one uh, from Michael Hennessy. Uh, from an, a, an arable perspective, would a mix of grassy margins, uh, maybe uh, two meters combined with well-managed flowering hedges, along with oilseed rape or other possible beans be considered a pollinator friendly environment? Uh, and maybe comment about field size in the mix as well. That's a really nice question and it's exactly what our study was trying to answer. So I would say your rough tussocky grassland, it would be good at providing resources for nesting. And it's not just pollinators, it provides overwintering habitat for ground beetles. So you've got the balance between pollinating insects and natural enemies. So they would provide two resources for the two different taxa. Your early flowering hedgerows, again, nice for early season resources. Your oil seed rate field beans, well, in Scotland, that's May, June flowering typically into July. So what I would say is lacking in that mix is probably a late season resource. So we find in Scotland, at least, our flower rich margins tend to flower between July and August. So effectively, the late season resource is very, very important because that's the time that pollinators are breeding. It's also the time the new queens are storing up energy and fat reserves so they can hibernate and last during the winter. So from what was said, I would say, look into some late season resources, so species, like devil's bit scabious, knapweed, um, red clover, these are all important later on. Okay, another one there, uh, is there any simple, easy to manage farmer tools uh, that are able to account for, for how, su uh, how successful their efforts have been in, in uh, managing habitats for pollinators? So is there anything that they can judge their success or otherwise by? I think that's something we are trying to work on at the minute. So we are trying to use the data we've got to determine what is the best farmer friendly indicator. I mean, it's we are identifying maybe 60 species of hoverflies and 10 species of bees. And I don't think it's fair to expect a farmer to do that. But what we are trying to see is what else could they monitor that provides a good proxy for the actual number. So we're doing some work in that at the minute. 
And just uh, one other question there, uh, and it's, there's a kind of a couple of questions around this, uh, and uh, I suppose asking it, how far do, do pollinators travel and how close do the various kind of integrated habitats need to be together to actually provide a, a coordinated uh, habitat infrastructure for them? I love that question. <laughs> and I think it's really important. So it really depends on your pollinator. So for your bumblebees, they may travel about a kilometre. So there you're dealing with quite a large spatial scale. So they're central place foragers. So they come back to the nest every night. So I think that's something to also acknowledge. So they're very tied to one location. Whereas your solitary bees, they tend to have a much lower dispersal. So for me, what you'd be thinking is solitary bees tend to be active primarily early in the season. And they are thought to only, well, depending on the species, but they are maybe about 300 to 400 meters they can travel. So here you've got to think, do I have solitary bee nesting sites? So that could be stone walls, but do I have early season resources within that small distance? And then you have species like hoverflies, and many of these, they aren't tied to a nest in the same way as solitary bees and bumblebees, and they can breed in the agricultural matrix a lot of them. So you've got species such as your marmalade hoverfly, there's a lovely, stripy, and he's really the colour of marmalade. He's brilliant, but he's a predator of aphids as a larvae. So he can quite easily breed within the agricultural matrix on aphids. Okay. Okay. There has been a question here about the effect of climate change on uh, pollinators. And I know we had some talks there a number of years ago there from, from colleagues in Trinity College about the, the, the changing of the seasons or the delay in the seasons. What are, are you observing any impacts there in Scotland? I think there's two things. So there's flowering period which can change and there's this worry that you'll get a mismatch so your flowers will come out at a time that isn't kind of adapted to the pollinators. The other thing that we are seeing is we are getting different species appearing. Um, most notably, we have different species of butterflies. So we've got species like the ringlet, which has appeared in our Highland Research Farm, which was never there before. In my garden in Ayrshire, we've got the holly blue, butterfly that appeared maybe five years ago. Again, we had never seen this before. So the species moving northwards. We also have the tree bumblebee, which started in the south of England and has sweeped up the country. And I would say it was now one of the most dominant um, bumblebees that I'm seeing, at least in my garden in Ayrshire now. And that's only the last few years. You talked about um, using proxies there for maybe non-experts to, to evaluate the, the quality of a habitat perhaps or uh, the, the species diversity. Have you seen any interesting technological solutions coming through there? Um, I know, for example, I've seen some apps that are very good at plant identification and so forth. Uh, do you see a role for, for, for those types of um, innovations? I think there is. So I know there's been a team working on looking at the wing veins of bees. Now, solitary bees, we've got over 250, well, about 250 species. And so they're incredibly horrible to identify. Um, but seemingly by taking a photo of the wing and the placement of the different veins in the wings, they can identify it. But how farmer friendly that would be, I don't know, because it involves capturing it, it involves getting a photo of the wing. It's very easy when the sample's pinned out in a box. There's also at uh, the University of Leeds, they are using um, acoustic to try and determine. So 
they are trying to monitor the noise that bees, I mean, everyone knows if you're in a habitat that's full of bees, it's, you can hear them buzzing. So they are trying to analyze that data to try and get some sort of metrics, which might be more practical for a farmer. Sure, sure. Uh, just a, a, a couple of questions. One, uh, in intensive grassland areas, are uh, some of the do's and don'ts that farmers might take on uh, uh, to help the pollinators? Uh, I suppose we have a, a quite a number of very intensive grassland uh, habitat areas. So I would say your hedgerow management is very important. What we tend to find in Ayrshire is that hedgerows get quite degraded and also the species present are quite um, low. So our hedgerows are primarily beech and hawthorn. So if you're maintaining or trying to re-establish hedgerows to increase the number of species, I would also say that um, if you're creating water margins for riparian buffer strips, that's also very important. So they can provide really nice habitat throughout the season. The little bit of disturbance from the water course can increase the number of flower species. And you've got the added benefit that you're reducing pollutants entering the water course and you're providing habitat for um, other species. So you've got lots of insects, so you're providing habitat for species such as the yellow hammer that go in um, insects off the foliage. So quite, quite, um, I think quite a good potential for a lot of benefits from our riparian buffers. Our research has indicated that we could maybe get more benefits if we introduce either cutting, which can be really tricky if you've got a very confined space, or grazing at the back end of the season could increase the value very even more, so opening up the vegetation structure. Just to follow on from that, Lorna, we had a speaker a number of weeks ago from our forestry services talking about native woodland plantations. And we were discussing how really it was better to be looking at a landscape level rather than at a farm level. Have you any examples of that approach uh, in Scotland or where maybe a more landscape approach is taken rather than just a farm level landscape in the context of ag agro-environmental planning? I think... What, what I feel is currently in Scotland, we have priority areas for certain measures. So, for example, it targets an issue in that location. So for Ayrshire, our, we've got a lot of um, measures for diffuse pollution mitigation. And in a way, what this can do when it comes to riparian management is it can simplify the water course, which from a diffuse pollution point of view, fencing the whole water course is perfect. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to biodiversity, these zones are very diverse and you want to ensure you keep that di natural diversity. Mm -hmm. So simplification could be really quite detrimental for biodiversity. So it's about targeting the correct measure in the correct place, I would say. So where you have intensive livestock grazing on steeper banks, that's probably where you'd want to fence. And maybe in the more extensive beef grazed areas, at least here our beef grazed areas are less intensive, then you could maybe um, open up the water course to allow access. And in terms of biodiversity corridors throughout a landscape, have you seen uh, examples of that, you know, farmers working together or being funded or incentivized to work together? I've not personally seen examples of that, but I'm sure there probably are. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, I mean, farmers are quite independent 
and you know they're used to working for themselves in their own way so I think that collaboration you know we really do need to try and help them collaborate if we do want to take a landscape scale approach I know that the schemes we are running now are trying to encourage that more and they'll get extra points if they are taking a more holistic approach or a landscape scale approach. Perfect, very good. Pat, uh, more questions coming. A couple of questions about uh, uh, wetlands and boglands as to the, the, the level of pollinators that, that, are, that there's evidence of there and is there anything can be done to improve? So, for example, Farm Woodlands is a paper just coming out and it kind of highlights, especially in arable landscapes, also in grassland landscapes, there's a tendency to fence off ponds, which results in them becoming infiltrated with scrub and trees. And that can mean the floral diversity at ground level declines. So opening them up again, some form of management, but then I know you've got conflicts with wetland area and grazing and liver fluke. So it's that balance between trying to control liver fluke and provide the perfect habitat for pollinators can be quite tricky. We have a couple of questions uh, about the, the uh, I suppose people are a little bit surprised about the, the coniferous and deciduous woodlands and, and the, the, the low ob uh, observed level. And I think you, you may have said that there's question marks there. But uh, there's a question there. Is, is there anything we can do in planning and managing these that uh, might have a, a positive impact? I think what we found is where we did get pollinators, they were along the edge of the woodlands. So um, increasing the edge of, edges of them, creating glades and rides through them. Um, I think that's the main aspect. And also to kind of think where you want the best edge. So for example, pollinators really don't like foraging if it's shaded. We quite often will see flowers that have the potential for foraging pollinators but because the shade the pollinators don't use them. It depends on the weather conditions but um, when it's cooler they certainly won't um, use shaded habitat so targeting south facing um, edges to make the most out of them would be particularly beneficial. Okay, and uh, uh, just, I suppose, an, uh, a request for advice in relation to some of the practices that farmers do in terms of reseeding and uh, where you are actually using pesticides. Are there anything that people can do to, to minimize their negative impact or, or have a, a positive impact? I think from an arable point of view, it would be to leave the field margins undisturbed. Um, from a grassland point of view, there are things like um, trying to diversify the swords. So we've got some quite innovative farmers in the UK or in Scotland, and they're looking at really diverse sword mixtures. So chicory, um, clovers, yarrow, and these swords, they may, they may result in a decrease in yield, but because they've got the diversity, I think what they can do is they can stabilize yields where you get different, um, say you get an extreme wet or an extreme dry period. So I think it's recognizing that some years you might be worse off, but you could get a year that would be an absolute crash in a rye grass ford actually doing quite well in a diverse ford and I think also you've got benefits such as these diverse spores the deeper roots can um, reach micronutrients deeper down in the soil there's been so there's um, more micronutrients more amino acids that are provided by these diverse 
Sports Wars. So there's additional benefits to um, the welfare of livestock as well. Just one, and then maybe this is a finishing one. Do you think there are ways in which additional payments can be uh, brought into our agri environmental policies to, uh, I suppose, uh, improve our, our performance in relation to, to pollinators? So additional payments from well, uh, uh, it's just your, uh, I suppose a redesign or a relook at our, our our agri environmental policy measures, if you want. What what direction would you be suggesting? I think probably more money into pillar two. So pillar two, am I getting it confused? Yes, yes. Into yeah, yeah. agri agri, agri environment, environment and climate yeah. schemes would be obvious. I think though. There's what we haven't tapped into sufficiently is branding food in the correct way. And I think to currently we've got organic food or conventional. We have the odd in between where you've got, you know, RSP, be friendly or these types of things. But I think more branding so that people in the supermarkets can make a choice and choose a agri-environmental and a pollinator friendly or biodiversity friendly produce in addition to organic or conventional. Yeah. Okay. Mark, just a, a, a comment. A, a huge number of the comments coming in have been complementing the, 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 the presentation and I think if there's if there's any measure, we, we see the numbers that are, are still here. Nobody has been leaving the, 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 the talk. We normally get a little bit of a tail off towards, towards 10, 30, but uh, in fact, nobody's been leaving. And I think that's, that's a testament to the, to, to the message you've had for us today. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And, and thank you for such a high, yeah, high quality presentation. And I couldn't agree with you more in relation to the branding. I think there are real opportunities there for, uh, you know, making a, a, um, a, a show, showing a difference between uh, agri-environmental produced um, and we do have certain conservation grades that are out there. So, uh, Lorna, thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, effort during the week. I know we, we were having some technological problems during the week, so uh, we do appreciate the effort that you put in for today. Um, Pass, thanks for your assistance with the questions today. And I also want to thank our production team uh, for the support, in, uh, in particular Catherine Keena, uh, for coordinating this uh, month of uh, biodiversity talks, Andy Boland uh, and Yvonne Maher uh, for their uh, important work in the background. So uh, with that, from all of the team, take care and stay safe. And we look forward to speaking to you next week. Thank you. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.